We're going to start now. Kill it. Hello, before I start, I need to share with you that presenting makes me very nervous, and hence I'll be reading for my paper, which means I will not be making eye contact or making jokes. And I do not have a PowerPoint, but a couple of simple images for you to look at, if you'd prefer. I want to say thank you to Simon for asking me to present my practice, and to you for being here to share the space with me. I am Teresa Cisneros, a Chicana Mexican-American, the daughter of Vicente Cisneros and Lucrecia Puente, both of Mexican lineage. I am from La Frontera, the Mexico-Texas border, about five minutes from the Rio Bravo. You may wonder why I open with this detail. The reason I open with this is so you don't have to wonder where I am from or what I am, and because I practice from where I am from, not where I am at. I am not of this place, nor do I wish to be. Where I come from, we practice a form of philosophical way of being, which is, if you are okay, then I am okay. We are taught from an early age that each decision we make affects someone outside of our own being. We have to think through collective being. A friend recently said to me, you are life out because you are a desert person, and desert people know they can never act alone because to survive you depend on one another. Well, northern Mexico, Texas border is very much a desert. I have desert and border ways of thinking about the world and the many spaces and systems I navigate. Before I read further, I want to ask you to imagine my practice over the years as an act of urgency addressing the emergency of a systemic oppression that how I have had to behave, be, and think is always in a form of constant alert. That how I move through the institutions is an act in relation to immediate attention and to solution, often not knowing or understanding what, if any, institutional impact I will have, but feeling that by my being there, it will push others to think more critically, behave differently, or give up their space for another. I would trace my practice over the years across two continents both whom inherently have colonized bodies and people, which is a state of emergency, past, present, and future. My practice does not think about changing or responding on mass scale, but through intimate systemic methods. Currently, I have a curious title and a full-time position in a prominent institution. I am inclusive practice lead at the Welcome Collection, which is part of the Welcome Trust, a trust dedicated to funding medical science research globally. As inclusive practice lead, I am tasked to work with 150 of 800 people. These 150 people make up the core staff of the Welcome Collection, which has a medical science and art collection, an archive, a library, and exhibition spaces, both permanent and temporary, and we also publish. In any given month, we program over 150 events, ranging from live art performances to book launches. Along with the 150 members of staff, we are on different types of contracts. We also have about 70 casual service staff. You might wonder why I'm telling you these details and what this means to my practice. As inclusive practice lead, I have been tasked to make our institution more inclusive. In 2018, the Welcome Collection created one of the most radical access, diversity, and inclusion strategies I have ever read or been involved in rethinking. It was clear that we must ensure it, deaf, disabled, neurodiverse, and racially minoritized communities are included or involved in everything we do and how we do it. I want you to hold this in your mind, that I would be perceived to be part of the diversity or inclusion professional sector. Those that come to solve the, day, dare I say, diversity issue, as of being excluded by an oppressive system is the issue of those excluded. Let me start with my title, Inclusive Practice Lead. I am the model of inclusion, that my role practices behavior as an example to always being in a state of being inclusive. Though I do admit I am a walking intersection. If by the end of this talk, one of you can guess my intersections, I will give you my very generous discount at the Welcome Bookshop. But let me not go on a tangent. Before I tell you where I am currently, I think it's important for you to know how I got here. The unknowing how I was moving in the world, that titles change or personal ethics stay the same for someone like me that I do not budge when I think that something is not just or fair, that I will call you out and hold your hand whilst I tell you what you just said or did is not okay and why. I practice a form, I practice from a place of compassion. Please do not mix this up with the, with the empathy stuff. I originally studied ancient philosophy in the classics. I even learned ancient Greek. 
I did this because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer in Texas, because, well, I love to argue, but I also deeply care in justice. Sadly, sitting in rooms of white men and being the only female left a lot to be desired of the study of ancient philosophy, because those white men were always right and correct. I nearly changed my major, but thought I can't three years in and then start again. I stuck it out. I completed my BA armed with who knows what skills. I left feeling like I had just sat in rooms with white men again and again and again. And my brain had been empty. Luckily, a friend had noticed that I enjoyed my art history classes. So they encouraged me to apply to art school for an MA in arts administration, since I knew I was leaving the idea of law school, of law school behind. So I applied, and wow, I got into an art school. I escaped having to take the GRE, an entrance exam, to ensure you know how to do graduate school. That was my second testing in. I, some, I circumvented. The first was the one for my BA. This meant I was on my way to learning how to become an arts administrator. But before I got there that summer, I was a 21-year-old heading to undertake a research fellowship at the Smithsonian Institution of American History. I again was told by the same friend there were fellowships who do research as part of a group called Inter-University Program for Latino Research. I proposed to undertake research in the archives to locate the presence of Latino women in the US workforce between 1900 and 1960. I thought surely this was documented at the Smithsonian, but apparently we were not that important, so off I went to D Washington, DC. I arrived early in the summer to have my first real experience of noticeably, noticeably being an outsider of one of them, but not like one of them. I remember, I remember meeting the other fellows. I didn't look like many of them, and I was on the younger side, but I also understand I appear younger than I am too, so they fe feigned a bit of surprise. We all got our passes. We met the archivists, the people who were there to support our research. I remember a woman saying to me, here's your pass. You have access to our, our museums and related archives, and then she pointed around. As I walked away, I heard her ask a white blonde woman, what she was there to do re to research, they seemed to be engaged in a conversation. As I walked away, I had a strange feeling that I was not one of them and that my very short introduction was evidence of this. I took this as a sign that I was not going to be watched or cared for, so I did just, so I did just what I wanted to do. I opened drawers, requested material, and demanded and demanded and demanded. Everything my heart desired, mostly in photographic form. I did not cower and say, oh, I am not one of them, or they treat me differently. Instead, I thought, fuck you. I have every right to be here as all of you, and I will do my work as best as I can, with or without someone's blessings. And I had one of the best summers meeting all sorts of radical researchers, and I produced one of the first reports on Latinas in the workforce, evidence through photographic form. I thought, not bad for someone who did not know what they were doing. <coughs> Directly after I headed to the art school to master arts administration, I spent two years again pushing the institution to create fair access to spaces for some bodies and rethinking the curriculum. Today, you'll have the decolonizing the curriculum. Many, many, many years ago, I alone in an art school of 2,000 wrote letters in our newspaper and outed our lecturers on their inability to see art history from a global perspective and that art or its history was not owned by white European culture. Though in those days, I was not savvy enough to think but do non-white folks around the world want to be part of that art history? I guess you can say my world of institutional activism as an outsider on the inside had begun and lonely. I completed my master's while also undertaking curatorial classes. While doing my MA, I also organized exhibitions and fundraised for projects collaborating with fellow students and external established artists. I always say my formative years were in Chicago where I studied. At the end of my MA, I was also organizing large house and techno raves for 2,000 people in warehouses. I guess you can get an idea of how I was navigating two worlds at all, at all times, something familiar to me. After completing my master's in arts administration, you can say I felt like I had become one of them, a colonial administrator. I prefer to think I mastered colonial administration, but I used the logic of the colonial administrative system against itself to reconstruct it from the inside. It's important to know the system you want to reconstruct, and knowing its logic and language is very helpful. I state this because I will share with you a few projects I have been involved in and illustrate how I went from being a coordinator to manager to a curator to lead to arts administrator, or better yet, a curator of people. You can say I've always navigated two or three or multitude of systems at any given time that I cannot think in a singular way. I'm from two continents. <clears throat> I grew up speaking Spanglish, so my mind has always thought in a non-singular way. 
And so I think this is why I'm now where I am today, that the inclusive practice thing is about this holding a multitude of ideas or experiences, experiences at once. I left Chicago many years ago, then spent time in Texas only to come to England. I have to admit coming here not by choice but out of love was a shock. There were no bodies that were like mine. I was confused for being from here or there but never from Mexico. What I quickly realized was that I had an advantage that my ways of being and thinking were a little outside of others. Institutionally speaking, I behave very differently because I was taught this, that speaking up, that requesting, that demanding, that organizing, that being compassionate are all very important ways of taking care of one another. This was not common for most of my colleagues and still isn't. I arrived to be interviewed in London for a job in the music industry because I applied for art world jobs and was not called back. I also went to a few interviews, but what I look like on paper and what I look like and sound like in real life is possibly too jarring for some folks. After the music job, I left it because the person I worked for was too unethical and thought the public funding she received was for her only. I took up a job with a construction company as a temp, which was great in theory, great pay, but the moment I was offered a permanent job with a great pay package, I said, it's time I leave this, this and hustle till I get that art job. And while I applied for a role as education curator with INOVA, the Institute of International Visual Arts. And while I didn't get the job, so I emailed the director and asked, why not me? I know I was the best candidate because there aren't many people who have worked the way I have nor looked like me. I know this may sound arrogant. I'm not arrogant, but I also did believe I was the best one based on what they wanted. He emailed me and said, Let's meet, there's a grant we want you to work through. A month later, they called me back and asked me to lead on another project. Then the, the grant came through and I was able to create many collaborative projects with contemporary artists, many at the start of their careers, some of which have gone on to be part of biennial, the biennial world or getting major commissions. What I did was use my role as education curator and exploit it, what this meant to both the gallery and the outside world of only thinking of exhibition curators as the only work to do in the gallery. I always said the same thing to artists I collaborated with. Use my commissions to pilot or experiment. Your name will be on our website and all our marketing material. This may not be a major show, but use a platform to get your name out and push your work. This was my way of reconstructing the value and importance of the education role or what it could be. I was not going to settle for, the, their, for there only being one idea of what curating looked like at that time. It was me understanding I had some power in a system which often excluded and excludes the people I was collaborating with, using the logic of it to critique it and reconstruct it. I spent too many years in one institution, but how could I not? It was a fertile ground for me to establish myself and experiment in a somewhat stable environment. Whilst there, I also started a collective called The Innovators for 18 to 25 year olds, where I created a framework of collaboration where I was the institutional curator, I employed a cultural theorist who was also a project manager and, it, and an emerging artist who will work on six month projects with up to 15 people to conceptualize research and deliver whatever they wanted. The group self-named, but it was a soft way to get young people applying to art school, but also to support those doing MAs in institutions where identity politics or coloniality was not discussed. But I have to emphasize this group was open to all, some people were not in formal education, but what they all were is creative. Years later, a few established a jewelry brand. One just curated the architecture biennial in Chicago, and another established a web development company, and another manages Microsoft social media. So this may not have just made art people, but supported young people who otherwise might not feel like they could follow these types of careers. These young people came from all over London and from all types of backgrounds. My last project with Innova was a collaboration with Barbie Asante's called Baldwin's Nigger Reloaded. If some of you are offended by my use of the N-word, I will let you know that I have entered deep conversations about the use of this word and its purposing within this project. The project focused on James Baldwin's documentary with Horace Sovey of, of a time he came to London and was asked, where are you from? Where black identity was explored, the documentary is called Baldwin's Nigger. In this collaboration with Barbie, I decided, and I, we just decided, we wanted to develop a new collective of, creative use, of creatives using archives, our networks, and the gallery. So we did an open call and 15 people applied, all between 18 to 25. They did research for six weeks as it, and ended with a major project at Innova, inclusive of an exhibition, new films, talks. The group decided they wanted to continue, so we mentored them through this process and they became the Sorry You Feel Uncomfortable Collective. Some of you might know who they are.
I now act as mentor and, uh, and when they need me. I was once asked why I was so keen on supporting them, and I said because I do not want them to wait 10 years to access the institution. I am creating a shortcut for people who do not have the networks, the money, or might not be the right shape white. I got into the arts because Mary Murphy, an Irish curator, invited me to work for her without knowing me. She protected me in the institution while it's gently mentoring, and I have always felt I will do this for others. What in my mind I do in my position is once I am invited into the institution through the door, I then take a sledgehammer to the wall to create a large hole for others to come into it. I don't need your fucking door is how I see it. I was made redundant from any of them due to budget cuts, but I think there were issues because I have brought a public grievance against management. But I will leave this here. After Innova, I started an agency called Agency for Agency, a curatorial collective that's what we set on paper, but what we did was instigate projects and critique institutions through their policies. The project was Barbie Asante, an artist, Jessica Harrington, our silent grant writing wizard, and myself, the institutional person. Between Barbie, Barbie and I, we had enough networks to be offered projects and put ourselves forward. But I also understood what the Arts Council wanted and also what they needed to fund. And crassly put, they needed more non-white artists in the institutions as public funders. I, of course, am more than happy to take money based on being non-white. I call it melanin money or small reparations to balance out a bit of the colonial legacy. I take it because it's about what we do with it, not that it's a way for me to make a living. I decenter myself in most of what I do. During this time, I was also a curatorial fellow with the showroom gallery. I did, get it, I did this not because I wanted to be a curator, but because the fund was 100,000 pounds from Arts Council's <coughs> Changemaker grants. My idea was Object Positions, a curatorial project exploring decolonial processes, cultural equity, and colonial administration, which is a series of lectures, artist development, a network for non-white cultural workers, an exhibition and a piece of writing I call Document Zero. Over this, 18, over this period of 18 months, I was in seven institutions exploring their diversity policies and how staff did or did not work through this thinking. This took the form of meetings, loose workshops, but ultimately it spoke truth to power by holding non-hierarchical forms of conversations, conversations to read through policies. As policy and administration is where all the power lies, but people don't think about this when they sign contracts or in jobs. What I wanted to explore was policies of care, what policies of care were and or could be by centering inclusion of voices at all levels. Of course this was disruptive and scary for those in decision making power, but this tells you much about those people as opposed to the people on the ground delivering on behalf of this institution. I have to admit the work was hard, but I found where I needed to be and in many ways wanted to be. My first job, my first art job was at the Chicago Culture Center, where when I was asked, what shall we put on your card, I responded, well, not assistant, because I am not, I'm no one's assistant. So we left it blank to being manager, to being a curator, to now an arts administrator. But what I really see myself as is a curator of people, which is basically administrating bodies. In many ways, I have returned to what I was trained as, which is a colonial administrator. But now I am comfortable and excited about the potential of, the, of this thing I am now. Oh, I think I skipped. No, no. I close today with sharing on the Welcome Collection and my role. I know it does not look like curating on the outside, but if you take back the word to, to curar, which is to heal, what I am now doing is healing the colonial wound. I have been asked to think and put forward methods to deal with the legacy of coloniality which has been to oppress the non-white body, the disabled body, the othered body, for the gain of the white, abled bodied, heterosexual, heteronormative, neurotypical, patriarchal one. In short, I was asked to develop practice to address the lack of inclusion in all that we do, but mostly in our audiences and partnerships. I started in December 2018. Over three months, I asked lots and lots of questions of staff. I had too many cups of coffee and chatted and chatted. I was always asked, what is your strategy? And I would respond, if I have one, you need to fire me because I, I need to listen first. So what I heard was lots of people who were unsure what to do, how to be, insecure of their knowledge, afraid to lose power. They were all holding on to their little bit of power and showing they did not know what was seen as a weakness. I took this back and thought, I am here to think about inclusion and what the institution had wanted solutions. I am not a solutions person, I'm a questions person. So I spoke with my supervisor and said, 
It is unethical for me to hold my colleagues accountable for something they do not know how to do. We have a policy on diversity and inclusion, along with a very clear strategy, which is great. These are the internal laws. It was like someone asking me to do their plumbing and I am not a plumber. You see, many folks think the diversity and inclusion work is just about training people once or twice, a, a tick box. For me, it's about digging deep in the person and teaching them a new set of cognitive skills or abilities. I know people who look like me that say, I am done teaching white people or I am exhausted. I say, I have always been taught by white-centered education systems, but now white majority institutions can pay me to teach them to be more human, hence my interest in how we think and behave to be inclusive. As a result of this rethinking, I said what I need to know is why are staff not practicing inclusively? I lobbied and lobbied to propose a new framework to get to the heart of the problem. I call it person-centered design for inclusive practices. It's a four-month research project where I brought external design researchers to take 10% of the staff on a deep research period. They all go off schedule to attend monthly meetings. This started in November and will end in February. What we aim to understand are the needs of our staff to really hear and listen to why they don't practice inclusively, since they are all well-meaning, educated people. It's a moment where we center vulnerability and honesty. I designed this process with a psychotherapist to hold the meetings as well. Because I know that people would feel uneasy, scared, ashamed, guilty, uncomfortable, and any number of emotions. This work is deep, it's painful, it's uncomfortable, but mostly it's emotional. I know this is not common in institution, but it's important that institutions also have space for emotions. The journey is soon coming to an end, and what I plan to do next is co-design solutions with staff and experts on what we can do to catch people up on what they need to learn or to learn or what processes, processes we can co-create in order for people to go on learning journeys, which will be mandatory for all staff. With this process, I hope to create frameworks and methodologies which we can share with sectors. I went to start with the cultural sector, but already because Wellcome Trusts are only second to the Gates Foundation to fund global health and science research, I am being asked to begin thinking about how we can affect this area of research as well. The difference between what others have been doing in the area of inclusion and what I am doing is making the time, and because I am heavily funded, I can spend money on really listening to people and caring for them through the process. It is my hope that we will all go through action learning research sets where we use our workload to actively apply new ways of working and thinking in order to center inclusion in all that we do and how we do it and how we think. I end with what else I have recently done at the Welcome Collection. Because I am like an in-house consultant, I am the expert, remember, I am the lead on inclusive practices. There are short-term wins and then long-term wins to change oppressive institutional systems. I'll quickly share two. One is when I arrived at the Welcome, I was challenged by a curator to, paint, to have a painting room remove, removed because people did not want it there as it was offensive and just racist. It depicted a white Jesus with a white man in colonial wear on one knee helping a sick African boy with his Western medicine. I'll read the title um, below. It's a medical missionary attending, <coughs> excuse me, to a sick African oil on canvas, Harold Copey, 1916. Commissioned by the London Missionary Society in 1916, this depiction of a Western medical man at work in Africa was used to publicize the organization's activities. It shows a traditional local treatment cast to one side in favor of a remedy taken from the missionary's traveling medicine box which bears a striking resemblance to the tabloid medicine chest supplied to, explore, to explorers by Burroughs Williams. It was, of course, of its time. I had seen it before, but it remained for years. I took a liberty when I was sitting with the curating external person to ask why this painting was still up. The response was, because external advisors think it acts to provoke good conversation. I said, really? Are they the ones who have to defend why we have it up? I don't think so. I said, I'm go and I said, I'm going to take a fucking screwdriver and pull it down myself as it's awful and not okay to have it up. So by the next day, the painting was agreed to be removed. And it's in its place, we have put something that is, so, that is not so careless. However, we have replaced it with acknowledging that we still have the painting with this very interesting label. So the painting next to it uh, is the one we replaced it with, and it's the Abbey of Saint Antoine the Salon France pilgrim suffering from ergotism, approaching the infirmary in which the relics and bones of the saint are preserved, 
which were believed to cure the disease. It's oil painting by Ernst Borg. And then the label says, this painting has replaced a medical missionary attending to a sick African 1916 by Harold Coping, which we have returned to storage as part of a continuing process of reviewing, of reviewing what we display in Welcome Collection, Why and How. It depicts colonial hierarchies and racial stereotyping, part of history that should not be forgotten, but which could not be sufficiently countered and contextualized here without reaffirming those oppressions. We are moving towards redoing our entire Medicine Man gallery and rethinking our collections. This is just a flavor of how I am challenging from the inside and making it evident in small lacks. And last, the other, which I think is interesting, is our loans committee and where change can happen. We were asked by an established institution to borrow a painting. However, many of us had read the curatorial framework and found it reinscribed colonial thinking and racist behaviors. I was invited to my first loans committee when this came up. I reckon someone knew I would veto the loan. Some said we need to lend it because we don't want a bad reputation for being difficult. Another said it would be good for the painting and its context. I said, so would we lend this work to the BMP? The framework is not a little racist or a lot racist. It's just racist, so it's a no for me. And it was a no, of course. The director and our director emailed one another. I recall saying, if we say yes, we are undoing all that we are trying to be, which is inclusive. This also works in terms of our labels on the objects on loans. At first, people internally said, we could not require that our objects on loan have labels. We approved. And I remember saying, they are our, they are our objects. We have every right to decide what is said and how it is said. Because can you imagine the label has something racist or ableist or homophobic, and at the bottom it says, on loan from the welcome collection? I end by saying that just last week was another loans committee meeting where new terms for agreement on loans and policy insertion were shared. We will not be sharing with all our, borrow all our borrowers how we make decisions and how we center our inclusion policy and how we make them and who is accountable in this process. My presence by asking a different set of questions of by or by simply reminding my colleagues of what we all have signed up to creates impact, but it also gives them the confidence to say no, that it's not okay, and this is why. Thank you for listening to me read my paper. I hope you weren't too bored. Now I am happy to chat, which I am better at than presenting, and I will answer your questions in an honest way. So please ask anything you want to know or challenge me. Uh, I have. Uh Two questions are a little bit related, but the first one, uh, I was wondering if you could talk more in detail um, about the work you're doing right now at the Welcome, where you were saying that you wanted to see if it was possible to give members of staff, and maybe also members of the public, I'm not sure, new uh, cognitive abilities, and what might they be? Um, do I take this one? Or? Is it okay? We'll yeah. use this to talk. Yeah, until we're okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so cognitive abilities. So I often think that um, how should I say? We are the result as adults of all our upbringings, and we've been conditioned by the systems we're part of, whether it's education or family or friends. So concentric circles of how you should behave, and we learn from one another. So for me, it's about how do you unlearn but also then re-inscribe new behaviors. And I do think that um, if people practice a new set of patterning, you eventually start doing it without thinking you're doing that. And many, many years ago, I started, I had to do some CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy for managing pain. And what I was taught was about how I had to break certain patterns so I wouldn't put myself in that position again. And after going through that process, I kept thinking, could we break racist this way? But how could I do with an institution who has policies that say you have to behave a certain way because you work for them? So I often think in terms of policies and contracts. So not many people read the terms and conditions or your policies where you work. And those are actually the laws by which an institution practices behavior. So when I was at the Welcome, it was, it was an opportunity to say, you want to do inclusion, but you're, you're doing inclusion by a tick box. I'm more interested in 
going backwards and asking the question why we're not. And by actually listening to people and listening to their fears and their um, discomfort and vulnerabilities and just admitting, you know, we're all racist, we're all homophobic, we're all misogynist because we've been conditioned, all of us have in this room. I have it too. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm not. So I often think that um, methodologies are also about stripping things down, going back to where we come from and admitting to ourselves that we don't know how to. And it's like developing new sets of cognitive skills. So it's new abilities to think differently or you know, we're in an education setting. We're here because you're learning critical analysis, for instance. So it's kind of a constant state of reflection. But you have to teach people these new skills. You can't just assume they're going to learn them by attending a diversity inclusion workshop or an unconscious bias training workshop. It has to be practiced and built on. So I'm trying to make the next set after the research mandatory year-long journey of learning through practicing and um, being held by psychotherapists as well. I think it's important that institutions um, ensure that their staff's mental health is also supported through a process like this. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, no, I think that's, that's something that's definitely also uh, going to be a point of discussion here. I think there's uh, many attempts to think in that direction, both from, I think, the contrast between how students here uh, think about inclusion and how the college thinks about it in terms of ticking boxes, but we can get to that in a little bit. Um, something related, but maybe at the same time more general, but also uh, specific, is something that I've wondered about a lot and that we spend a lot of time on discussing, I think, among the students, is how to develop a, a kind of common language across continents, you know, which is often very difficult um, because we might not use, or we might use the same words but mean something very different yep. with them. Yep. Uh, particularly such a words as colonial and post-colonial, and for that matter, decolonial. So uh, one thing that I concretely wanted to ask you um, is, as having worked both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, what do you see as the main difference between how these discourses circulate and also the resistances circulate between, let's say, somewhere like London and UK and then Mm. Well, many different parts, really, of the United States. Mm. Um, I think fundamentally, the U.S. has gone through different, uh, uh, say, eras of rethinking where they are in terms of first um, racial conditioning and racism, where I think in the U.S. people are more apt to talk about it and call it out and think with it. Well, in, here in the U.K., um, I think it's only we're now reaching that point. So there have been some kind of pseudo civil rights movements within the UK, but nothing like the US, where you know we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. It's just one day, but the idea is that there has been a, a rebalancing of rethinking who is there. And I think we've just had politicians in place who speak openly. And I, you know, also in terms of critical race theory, the US is far ahead and who is writing, who's producing, and it's not just African-American folks or black folks or brown folks, it's all kinds of folks, Chinese-American, Japanese-American, so there's a wider breadth of understanding these oppressive systems from a variety of perspectives. Well, I think often in the UK, you have a few black voices. I mean, we're in Stuart Hall. I mean, it's an ama you know, amazing thinker, but nonetheless, it's still very limited, and you know, and I think um, institutions are not comfortable with dealing with it. Everybody's afraid of, again, being called out, being called a racist, or losing power. And instead, I think they keep kind of recolonizing people here, as opposed to kind of going, OK, we're going to throw up the institution and see how we can start shifting it. And it's also, in the US, I mean, it's, it's huge, 51 states, 300 plus million people. Professors are black and brown. It's not like here in the UK where you have, I think, 10 or 15 female black professors. If that, maybe that's too high. So who is talking in the universities and who's creating these curriculums? And I think the US is far ahead. So um, and in terms of the term coloniality, and I don't really like the word decolonial. I find it really problematic. It's become code word for diversity and inclusion, which is complete bullshit. Um, so I think like I always think through coloniality because we're still very much in the presence of it 
even if people don't think that. So I think it depends on your vantage point of, in terms of your own positionality and your own privilege of how you think of what colonialism is or has been or will be in the future. So you, oh yeah, you're always asking a different set of questions. And I don't know if when you take international students, maybe one of the things you all need to do is on the first day is agree to a term of like a lexicon of terms of that you will agree that this is how it's understood. Because otherwise you'll always be confused. There will always be confusion in the room. And some people will see forms of, that we see as Westerners as, um, as colonial acts and possibly in another country they won't see it as a colonial act. But yet we will stand with our privilege of knowledge and histories and critique and cast judgment as well, which is another thing that we do because we're so privileged here to a certain extent to think about these things in a, in a specific way. So yes, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a kind of balancing act, but I think it's really important as educators that you sit with your students and agree to the terms of agree, like the terms and conditions of how you will talk about these things as well. Because just as much as there are people come here to learn, we can also learn from other people too when they're here temporarily, which often, which is a privilege. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sure there are lots of questions, points of discussion. Okay, someone over there. Hi, <coughs> hi, where are you? Um, I am going to admit something. I don't read a lot of theory. Um, I know there's a lot of written on institutional analysis and psychoanalysis in the institution, and I was just on a panel with an expert on that, but I don't read about these things. Um, I practice quite intuitively, so I couldn't give you a, a, a psychotherapist, a theoretician who has worked on this. There are, I know that, but I don't. I just think mostly through what would it mean to have to sit through something like this. And I think of institution as a living organism. It's like a family, it's dysfunctional. Every family is dysfunctional. Someone wants more power, someone has less power. Everyone complains. Some want to do, some don't want to do. So it's if I think of the institution as a microcosm of society, but also family, and so in many ways what I'm trying to do is hold the staff which make up the institution. So people are the institution. We, we tend to think sometimes the institution is like this object thing, which it's not. It's us who make up the institution. And it's to make people realize that we all have individual power within an institution. So this is what I'm always trying to grapple with. Well, what does it mean to have 150 members of staff who don't realize how much agency they actually have and convincing them they have that agency to say yes or no, but also that they're also required to behave in certain ways while they work for us. And it sounds kind of contradictory, I know it does, but I really do, and it sounds awful, I do really believe in the carrot, uh, not the carrot, I believe in the stick, you know? And people go like, that's fucked up. But I also think that if we're paying you then in many ways you should agree to behave by what we ask you to do. After five o'clock, what you do is your business as long as it's not gross misconduct. Because what the institution asks you to do is actually be more humane. 
by being inclusive as opposed to being exclusive. I don't think it's a big ask, but people do fight it and won't want to do it. So I'm in constant negotiation in terms of behave, uh, how I have to, how I speak about these things. Because I know it's not, um, I don't know, it's not acceptable to say, yeah, I'd like to use the stick. Because that's society. I mean, we're policed all the time, you know? So it's sort of, it's a similar thing. But in this case, we choose to work for these institutions. You know, we get paid to be there. We get paid to say yes or no or our expertise. So uh, I hope I kind of answered. <laughs> yeah. The stick. Does the stick work without the carrot, though? Well, the, <laughs> the carrot is a nice salary. OK. I think the carrot is understood. Oh, oh I can't. It's maybe. It's okay. So, um, but, well, first and foremost, I have to say because of the way I've already been raised by this idea of like, if you are okay, then I am okay, which is also decentering the self and the neoliberal idea of the individual, which it may not be border, but for me, it's a very border way of thinking. So, the moment I ask questions, the questions being asked are not about me, they're being asked for in collectivity and in our work you know we're taught that we have to work in competition with one another and I don't I think I work collaboratively at all times so even that to be in collaboration at any one moment is already acting in contrast to Western white Western ways of being whether they're European or American or actually even Mexican white there are ways that people behave that are very liberal you know neoliberal I mean it's not a just a European thing. So, um, but I also think through this idea of healing the colonial wound, which um, I also practice as a curandera, which is a Mexican healer. And so I, I get often asked why, you know, everyone says, I'm so exhausted, I'm so exhausted, emotional labor. And I say, well, then you shouldn't do that work. You know, I do this work because it's kind of like, Sounds hokey, but it's like the calling. Like, I don't have a choice. This is what I do. And so then when I say I don't read theory, it's because this, I, this is just what I do. And even that, to give myself over to this idea, this is a calling, is already a non-Western way of being because you're taught if you do study art, you know, then you do your master's in art, and then you will make art, and then you'll go to a gallery, and then you will be shown, I don't behave like that or think like that. I just go wherever I'm kind of... Um, feel I need to be. So, and in terms of my colleagues, I center um, care quite a lot. So instead of being careless, which many institutions are, many people are very careless with one another, I always think about care. So even like coming into an office and bringing like sets of chocolate because it's Friday, people don't do that. People don't give. And like just by the act of giving, um, is part of it, but I was also taught how to always be in service to people. And in service has a lot of like religious connotations to it, but I also grew up Catholic and I grew up with indigenous ways, so it's all melded and the, the Catholicism is very colonial too and I understand that and I accept it, but I also revel in it, I enjoy it. So for me it's this idea of like, I'm in service to others at all times, but that's not common practice either. So what I try to do is in many ways uh, model this practice that it's okay to care and that it's okay to be emotional as well. That, and it's okay not to be competitive. That I think at the end of the day, you kind of have to be happy with, with 
kind of how you behave throughout the day. And yeah, so I think it's these things that make me almost a slightly off-centered from my colleagues. And, and as a result, I have to carry the weight of a lot of confessionals. So people confess to me all the time, inside the institution and outside the institution. So because I listen, and then I also have networks of people that I can influence to ensure things shift. So it's how I use that kind of uh, power too, that it's not about me, that it's about how I care for others. There's two in the very back. Oh. Um, okay. Um, so why choose? Who's asking? Sorry, I can't see. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So why choose to work within institutions, especially when institutions often represent the hegemony, or mm. can be like Yeah, because they're the best ones to destroy from the inside, <laughs> and also because they have the most, they have a lot of power. So I think about a place like the Welcome Collection or the Welcome Trust. It's, I think it's valued at over something like 325 billion pounds. Their main, it's, a pri it's private, completely private. We don't um, rely on money from, other, other co from anybody. And so we're only accountable to ourselves. And when I first applied to this job, I thought I am actually entering the belly of the beast of coloniality. This is the worst of the worst. I mean, it's probably 90% white, middle class. Majority is female. But for me, it was the fact that they give so much money to science research globally that if I could influence that, I'm also influencing other ways of being globally. So what I'm doing on the collection side is testing out an idea of framework of how we can start rethinking things. And um, once we create a methodology or framework, it's possibly going to go to the trust, which is 650 people, and these are the people making the decisions on who's going to get funding in the future. And so I'm kind of moving from art, the culture sector, to a science sector, because that's actually, it's about global health and science and research. So that's why. And um, yeah, I don't think I could be in a better place right now for, for what I want to do, because you are influencing, um, I don't know, future research in many ways, but you're also holding other people accountable so one of the things I'm trying to pass or get them to really think about is if you get a grant from us is how, what charter we can put in that will require all staff to go through some kind of inclusion training and that they will have to, we will give them the money to do that for a period of time before they receive the grant. So, you know, instead of designing medicine for white men, able-bodied men, we can design medicine and um, research differently for, you know, the, you know, the people who are never included in the research. So, yeah, this is why. Um, can I just the, yeah. side, do you also see the difference between the short and the long term yeah. goals that you were talking about? Because I definitely struggle with that. Yeah. So um so how many of you here have jobs? Can I see Okay. So um how many of you here have close family members you talk to? Okay. Some of us don't have extended families. How many of you have close network of friends? Okay. Um, how many of you ride the train and the tube or the bus any one day? Yeah. So this is where you start. So I always think that, I was asked this question a while ago too, it's like, what do you do? It's like, well, we all have uh, decision-making power. We all have small bits of power. Where we work, 
our family members, um, our friends networks, even in public spaces, it's what do you decide to talk about or not talk about. So I always think in terms of um, in, in intimate conversations being the most powerful. So if I have, I have a brother who's really homophobic. So he was the last one I came out to because my mom said he's gonna freak out. And so I told him and he was like, that's fine, you know, that's a, you know, it's like, oh yeah, whatever, it's you. Um, but it was this thing of like how my mom thought he was gonna react a certain way. So once we talked, it was fine. So for me, it was like, okay, so now you have a sister who like, who's in a relationship with a woman. So then he then starts thinking about homophobia in a different way. Now he knows he can't really say it in front of my child. So I always think about the layers of how we are in the world that like we, we carry our own worlds and we carry our own institutions and we have the power to say yes and the power to say no, but we also have the power to call out someone and sit there with them and actually go, you know, this is racist because X, Y, and Z. Many of us would just sort of say that's not okay, but we never say why it's not okay or the impact it has. So I, my work, I think about it very intimately, but it's now starting to have a ripple effect, which is, was not my intention, but I was brought in to think about 150 people. And so what can you do? Well, that's what you do. You, it's like, this, for me, it's the small acts that we have to go through. It's not that you take up arms or you become like insta-famous because you're calling people out. Like there's like anonymous stuff. The other thing is don't be anonymous about something. Say it and live it and do it. So like for me, I, the way I speak, the way I am, I curse, I, I'm a human. This is me all the time. I, I don't agree with like um, having to change because of who you're around or how you're around. So if you have your ethics, stick by your ethics. And like that's all you can do. You're a student, I know y'all are students, y'all could lobby, y'all could protest, y'all can do things. You do interesting things here. I mean, this is one of the institutions where you've had sit-ins. I don't know what else you can do. You're also uh, customers. You can withdraw your money, stop paying. You can, I mean, can you take the institution and sue it for not fulfilling its part of the contract? You should look at all your terms of agreements of being a student, seriously. I know uh, students who did that in California. They sued their institution because they weren't getting the education at MA level. So yeah, you use the system against itself. So understand like your policies. Seriously, that's what I would do. Yes, but you have to also feel comfortable with doing it because you'll just, you don't, or just do it. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Do you think you are gonna get fired from being a student? Yeah, I can understand. But I use my anger to change things. Just I, I, I say I'm happiest when I'm angriest. Because you know, we live in a really oppressive system, you know, we really do. And it's sort of like you can be angry till the day, you know, till the cows come home or whatever they say, but like you might as well just express it. I mean, you know, I at work, I, I wish some of you could see what I say at work, and it's like, well, what are you gonna do to me? You know, you have rights. You are, sorry, but you are a customer now. That's what the education system has turned into. So as a customer, you deserve a certain kind of quality, I don't know, education. And if it's about ensuring that your lectures are being and addressing certain kinds of themes, and you need to say, look, you're leaving out this entire art history, or you've said this remark. Like in, may, in many ways, they might appreciate it. You never know, because you know, they might think twice next time they say something or they forget to invite certain people who would be good to, to crits. I mean, I know a couple of years ago, a student actually came to me from here in MFA and said, 
I have a problem. I this has happened. They're not bringing in interesting people to do, excuse me, crits, or no one's addressing my work in a certain ways. Um, I said, well, go to your administrators. Go tell them. Tell them that you're there's a failure in the system, and failure is your tutors not addressing what you need to be addressed to. So that so. Yeah, read the fine print on your contracts, which is your agreement letters to be here. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering, as um, I, I suppose students and young artists are often um, presented with um, applications and grants which we could apply for, um, and I'm wondering on what, like, on what level we should start, or if you were presented with a grant or an opportunity to apply for some money that might have a, you know, a background which you don't agree with, but you think you can do more with the money than the history of the grant. Take the money. <laughs> I mean, like we're all we're all complicit. Who in here wears leather? Who's got leather shoes? Who's got plastic shoes? Who's got a plastic bag? Who's vegan? It's plastic. Where does plastic come from? Petroleum. Like it, we're all complicit. Take the money. I mean, I, I'm. I mean, you know, climate change. You know, it's inevitable. It's already happened. We're gonna die anyway, so might as well die happy. <laughs> Let me think. Oh, well, as a female who had a baby, um, I had an institution who, when I announced I was pregnant, um, there was an email sent between the director and the HR person. Well, now that she's announced she's pregnant, we have to update the HR policy or the maternity leave policy so that I would have gotten a worse deal from it. So I filed a grievance against them. I actually. Um, said, actually, you know, that was, and it was two women as well who did this to me. And I thought, and they considered themselves like real feminist, 70s, like whatever. And I was like, yeah, I can see you're real feminist. Um, and so they said they were going to give it to me. And I said, oh, I think you will. Um, so then um, I actually said, I'm going to file a grievance. And I did. A board member was like, no, we don't think you have a grievance. And I was like, I'm appealing it, and I'm going to get a lawyer now. So a friend of a friend gave me a lawyer's name, the woman. I later find out, found out she was like the Sunday Times, you know, top 10 lawyer for that year. I didn't know that. But like when I told the director, well, this is the lawyer I'm going through, I think by the next day, their lawyer got back to me and was like, OK, we'll give you what you want. <laughs> so yeah, so I think that's the worst thing that has happened to me directly. Um, other people have experienced other things. Everything from like hair being touched to um, being asked where they're from to comments on like um, really racist remarks on someone because they had mixed race children. And it, it's like lots of things. You know, people being um, put on gardening leave People, uh, also people believing um, if some, I, I know of a grievance that's happened where this person was um, later accused of something else by another person and the institution does not know how to solve it or hold it or kind of go, okay, we need to figure this out. So things become really messy, but um, all sorts of things. I mean, you know, nepotism, nepotism galore, you know, so and so hiring their friend, giving them jobs, like that happens all the time. And you know, then I hear the complaints of like, why do they have it? And no one wants to hold each other accountable is the problem. In this culture, there's a lot of lack of confidence to hold other people accountable for their behavior. And I, I'm happily going like, no, actually, these are the rules and the laws. If you don't agree with them, you need to figure out what to do. But this is not OK. So yeah, but the, I actually haven't experienced uh, racism in a traditional sense of racism but I don't think I would because I think people are slightly scared of me because I say what I think and I don't yeah yeah but colleagues do yeah
about like working within institutions in order to dis in order to dismantle them and I think embracing being a customer rather than like a student who's entitled to an education or something like that. I think I'm curious about the horizon of that way of thinking. Uh, if you like when we're being customers and we're using that status to attack the institution, is our goal to sort of become or could our goal be to become people who deserve an education that we can afford, or is it just like carte blanche until we crumble this thing? Well, I don't, I have to say, I don't want to crumble the thing. I love institutions. Like, I absolutely am for institutions. I'm just for more ethical institutions. So I'm not interested in dismantling or destroying it. I'm interested in reconstructing the institution. So if I'm a customer, and then I, I turn from being a customer to being an employee, I've experienced it in a certain way. So for me, it's like, okay, if I get a job within the institution, what, what, what can I do? What are the powers that I have by which I can start uh, using the logic of itself against it to start kind of going, oh, so you expect me to do this, but in the bylaws it says this. This is what you agreed to do, but you're behaving this way. This is not okay. And so you need to sort yourself out, sort your staff out, or um, you have to address this differently. So yeah, and actually we've entered the era where education's not free. Education is not like what it used to be. Um, it really is like, when people are like, the good old days. Yeah, education did have a good old days. We're just not gonna be in them anymore. And that's a reality. So I think there's real kind of fantasies like, oh, we can bring the institution down, we can break it up. You can't, you absolutely can't. I don't believe you can. I think you can reconstruct it. But I don't have any fantasy that um, institutions like this are ever gonna be um, really thinking about your total emotional well-being. They're not, because somebody has to make money not just this one, somebody has to make money to, be, to live their lifestyle, you know, they've already gone through their MAs, they have 20 years of teaching or 20 years of being administrators, they're owed certain things, and they're the ones who make the decisions. What you ha have to do is start getting into those positions. So currently, I was telling a friend that there are some of us who are gonna start entering director positions who've gone through professionalization of the arts, which were like the first curatorial programs of the RCA, or my arts administration degree, I'm from like the first kind of um, set of them. So as we come into them, we're coming into them very differently. So we're coming into art institutions with a different set of administrative skills and understanding. The people that were here before us, they didn't have that training, they didn't have the theories, they didn't have uh, the practice yet. So I think there is a potential that within the next 10 years, the people who move to these positions will start shifting how we behave institutionally. Yeah. At least that's what I hope. <coughs> you can ask me anything, obviously. By the way, if any one of you want to contact me, you're welcome to. I always offer, uh, I have an account at the welcome, which I can buy you free coffee, so I'm not paying for it, the institution is. <laughs> no, but seriously, happy to give you an advice or anything. What would you like me to do too? It's four groups, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, how do you manage the complexity of those four different perspectives, perhaps there's more, um, in this um, cognitive change that you want to bring about, knowing that each one of those are going to be different? And so those four groups that I refer to, the de deaf, disabled, neurodiverse, and racially minoritized communities, yeah. it's not about changing anybody 
about them or including them in the change that has to happen by the staff. So first we have to think about the staff and what the staff needs are. So every time we host anything, we actually ask about access needs. So we already know that everybody, potentially any one time in one room, there are people with diff uh, a neurodiversity of beingness. What happens in the institution, lots of people do not come out as being um, neurodiverse or having a disability. In our institution, there is not vis there's very little visible disability. So we have to think through all the time how we present, uh, how we um, show uh, every time we release something, it's audio, video, text, sometimes it's BSL. So in many ways, <coughs> what I need to do is develop uh, and co-design programs of learning and thinking and repatterning whereby staff members who are employed by us at any one point will be thinking how to program, design, develop, whatever you want to call it, with a variety of groups in mind. What would it mean to program an exhibition from, um, with an inclusive perspective, which is about inclusive design, so think about people with different disabilities. We look at the logos, you have to think about what the language you're using, is it accessible? You're designing a curatorial framework, you need to ensure that it's not racist. So that's what we do. But what we need to do is first teach the staff how to develop a way of thinking through other people. And it's not just sort of go like, oh, be empathetic, put yourself in their shoes. No, that's, that does not, I don't agree with that. I'm more thinking about what are the questions you're asking to ensure you're thinking through uh, inclusive perspectives. How, do you, how can you be inclusive of everything that you do and how you do it? So if, if by the time I leave this job, I, every staff member has like 10 core questions that they ask themselves every time they're going to develop a collaboration, they're going to design an exhibition, they're going to do research. They have 10 really reflective, critical questions that they're asking themselves about being inclusive. With these four groups in mind at all times, then I've done my job. Because I think once you start asking yourself these questions constantly, you always are that. You're practicing that. You embody it. So then it becomes like a, a way, a, a cognitive skill of like, it's a, it's a response. It's automatic. It's like, um, I explained it to a staff member. She's like, well, well, how do you, what is this thing you do? I said, the difference is between you and I, and she was a white colleague, female colleague, curator. And she says, and I said, okay, like this, it's very simple. I walk into a room, it's a networking room, big room. I said, what do you notice? And she said, oh, I always look for the windows because, you know, she likes to feel calm. And I said, well, I notice how many people have black hair in the room. And then I start looking. What do they look like? What's the age range? What are they wearing? What are the shoes? Because I'm tr constantly trying to process what is in the room. Who's in the room? How are they in the room? If I can teach her how to do that, she'll be thinking through the, once she walks in the door, in a very different way. And she was like, oh, I've never thought about that. And I said, well, of course you wouldn't because you're a white woman. You've never had to. You always walk around the world without having to ask a different set of questions because you have certain privileges, while someone like me doesn't have those. You're a disabled body. You walk into a room, you have to look for certain things. I want her to walk into a room and think about that next time. So it's that process. It's not that it's the four groups. It's a different way of like, it's, it's the staff member that I need to ensure is thinking differently. Does that make sense? Any more? Okay. Okay. You should get your money's worth because I'm being paid yeah. to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a bar outside, so. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Yes. <laughs> so we might have different types of questions out there. Okay. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.